Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we explore convenient yet effective shortcuts that will help you get ahead and move forward faster by becoming a better leader. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligence practitioner, Jim Grimbaugh. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because I have somebody on the show today who really gives you know, clarity around something that, quite frankly, I think just about every single organization can benefit from. Amy Radin, author of The Change Makers Playbook, How to Seek, Seed, and Scale Innovation in Any Company, is a native of Brooklyn, having been born and raised there long before it was the cool borough. Her passion for all things innovative is evident back to her teenage years the daughter of a pharmacist, small business owner dad, and an artist mom. Amy learned through her early experiences at Harold's Pharmacy what it really meant to serve customers, meet their needs, earn their loyalty, and stand out. She sees understanding people as the starting point for innovation of any type. Technology, in her view, is just an enabler. Amy is a proud graduate of the New York City public school system. She was a member of one of the first graduating classes of John Dewey High School an experimental school whose structure and programming approach were based upon a progressive philosophy of education. At Wesleyan University, Amy studied in the College of Letters, one of the first integrated curricula in literature, philosophy, and history. She loved the study of language and during a semester in Madrid and over the course of a summer at Middlebury College became near fluent in Spanish. She decided to round out her liberal arts education completing it with an MBA in marketing earned at the Wharton School. Amy is the kind of person who is drawn to what is possible with an emphasis on getting stuff done, not simply dreaming. She undertook a complete career pivot in 2014, leaving the corporate world to engage with entrepreneurs as an independent advisor. She is married to Mitchell Radin, her husband of 34 years. They are the proud parents of three children, Jared, Molly, and Shira, and they share their home with their rescue cat, JJ. Amy Radin, Help us get over the hump, please. It's great to be here, Jim, and looking forward to having this conversation about how to execute innovation. You know, people love to talk about innovation. Um, It's hard to get things done, and and helping people do that has really become my passion. Well, and I appreciate that. And so, I I mean, when we start talking about passion, uh, one of the things that I found very interesting when I was reading the book is how much you actually infuse emotion into this whole process. Uh, so your, your book, when you first open it, um, you know, really lays out the, you know, the roadmap of it's a playbook, right? But it, to me, it was a roadmap because it's kind of visually, you know, is that way where you go from, you know, discover position with purpose and go all the way through to achieving impact. Uh, and then in every single part, so each individual part of this book is chapters within that area. But then you put everything with, through a scrubbing process or an iterative process where you're asking about the capabilities, connections, and culture. Right. And so how did you actually come to the conclusion that you needed to do that as far as with these three C's, you know, for all of these particular areas? Right. I guess, you know, what happened with me is that um, no matter what role I played in my career, and even as, as you can tell from my early education experience, I was always drawn to what's different and what's next. And it's, it's much, you know, we as human beings tend to prefer just sort of sticking to the status quo. You know, we don't, we don't love change generally. And for some crazy reason, I was always different. I always wanted to go towards the white space. And really what I found you know, largely when I started to work on digital transformation back in 2000, and that was when people were just saying like, wow, there is some commercial possibility around this thing called the internet. We have to see how it's going to affect our businesses and our lives. Um, There was a lot of, you know, a lot of resistance, a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty. And what I found just from being a hands-on operator, because I had real goals, in those days, I was at City, and it was, you know, we had a budget, and we said, okay, well, you've got to make this stuff happen with, with the internet, um, that what I really saw as a practitioner of change 
is that the real key, you know, you can buy technology, uh, you can get office space, um, you can find designers, um, but the really hard part is can you build, can you attract talent and how you, can you build a culture where people are really working collaboratively um, because change is hard and it takes that sort of magic gluing of the right people in the connecting in the right environment to, to get you from where you are to someplace very different. You know, as you were talking, I started thinking as well, you know, you, you mentioned something about people not liking change and I've, I've having the opportunity to, to chat with a lot of folks who've actually studied this particular area. You know, uh, some will even say that, that, well, it's, it's not that people don't like change, is people fear change for a couple different reasons. First of all, if we do this change, how is it going to impact me, my job, my life, my family? You know, that is one very real fear. Uh, and uh, the others are is that our body was designed to be in cruise control. That's the way God made us. So in other words, we put everything into a habit, right? And then we repeat the habit. And then anytime we disrupt the habit, that's the part that's come, you know, somewhat uncomfortable. And then also we don't want to feel incompetent, in, incompetent because of the change. Right. I think all of those things are right. Um, change is, it's, it's emotional and it's physically difficult. I think, you know, I was, I was a pretty mediocre science school in high school, but one thing I remember from my high school physics class is Newton's first law, the law of inertia. And I think that very much applies to us, you know, you know, to people will stay on their, you know, an object will remain in motion on its current path unless it's forced out of position by something big and that's usually something bad. And so, you know, imagine a boulder coming down a hill and it gets slammed to the side. So that's us. We're kind of cruising along. Um, I think the other thing that happens is I, I think a lot about one of the principles of behavioral economics, loss aversion. And the theory of loss aversion says that we will um, discount upside and overweight downside. So if we see the opportunity to earn uh, $2 on a bet, we assume that we could actually lose four if things don't work out. So we will, we will just, it's just, it's, it's, it's really natural. I think the other thing that happens when you're inside any kind of an established organization, and it could even be a, a startup that's been around for a while. I don't think, uh, I don't think big companies own, own the, uh, own the space on, on bureaucracy and just getting complacent. But Big companies, especially big public companies, especially those who are regulated, they are engineered for predictability and continuity. And so imagine they just want the crank to keep turning continuously. And any you know, change, innovation, those are, those are discontinuities. They're like bolts being thrown into the, into the gears. Um, the system's set up to not tolerate that stuff. And so I think the question for established teams in any kind of organization is, sure, the continuity is important. Now, you want to run a healthy business and serve your customers with quality, but how do you allow for some discontinuity? And that's where the change comes from. You know, it's kind of interesting that you were saying that because as you were talking about that, I started thinking about how uh, we often have this quest for speed and velocity. And because of what you were talking about, the, the reverse actually happens. In our quest for the speed and velocity, we have all this repetition that occurs. And, you know, we need people to follow it in order to, you know, increase, you know, our speed. But yet that, in fact, creates so much friction that it slows us down. It is. It, is, it, it, it creates friction. And I think also, I think speed, you know, you raise a good point about speed because I think in today's world, speed is critical. You can be right and late and it, it just doesn't matter because there are people moving much faster than you, no matter what it is you're trying to do. And I think one of the challenges is it's not sort of running faster on the same treadmill. It's changing how you go about things um, to compress time. And it's been really eye-opening to me the last, since leaving the corporate world, I've spent a lot of time with, um, with many startups um, coaching them on enterprise business development and marketing and, and things like that. And it's been really eye-opening me to see how a startup who does not have resources, whose investors are on their backs to show returns, how they get things done. You know, and I'll compare to, you know, to the corporate world, even something as simple as a market research study. You know, do you need to do uh, the $200,000 study that takes five months to get the results? Or 
can you do a series of very well structured man on the street interviews to get enough clues um, to get to where you need to go? So, you know, they have a much better sense of when good enough is good enough. And that mindset allows them to move quickly. And they, they simply don't have the resources. So they have to be much more resourceful and scrappy. That, that is a, one of the big time compressors. You know, as, and as you were talking about that, I started thinking about something that we were discussing prior to actually getting on the interview. And, and, and it's how you have constructed the different parts of the book, which is there in three, it's in three. And you talk about that it's structured uh, in, in seeking, seeding, and scaling. Uh, and one of the things, as I had mentioned to you, that kind of stood out for me is I, when I was looking at this different, stru with the structure and the way that you have it, is I also started seeing different parts of the organization in my mind. And so for me, doing a lot of work with the front line, you know, in contact centers, customer service, and uh, I, uh, having that background and, and, and actually de developing those frontline leaders at call center coach is that I started seeing the seeking part being so critical and that so many organizations at that front line aren't capturing the things that they need to in order to be able to hand, you know, so insights off to the people who can actually do the seeding and then subsequently the scaling. Yeah, and I guess, you know, for me, and I know you, you shared in my bio that I, you know, my, my first job is really working behind the counter in my dad's store. And so I was a frontline person. And, it, it, you know, when you're, when, how you treat your customers determines if there's going to be money in the cash register at the end of the day. It's very, you know, that's like very real and visceral. And then I was really lucky to have worked, started my corporate career at American Express where um, we, the culture was such that as a, as a member of the marketing and product team, uh, my colleagues and I, we naturally would involve the, um, the employees who were frontline, the people on the phones all day in the call center. Um, whenever, we wanted, whenever we started a new project, whether it was a new marketing campaign or some big new innovation, one of the early steps was always to do something as casual as, you know, have a brown bag lunch with a group of reps, go sit in the contact center and monitor calls, you know, ask, you know, really get that input. So I think nowadays there's, there's certainly structured ways to get insights, you know, through technology and databases and all that and all kinds of tools for capturing insight. But I also, I also used to just read call center logs. And I, I remember riding the, riding the train early in my career and just reading printouts of customer comments. And so I think, it's a, the, the information is there and, and it's a matter of um, recognizing how big a role the contact center people can play and then making room for them at the table um, from the beginning of the process. I'll, I'll tell you one quick story that I bet you'll enjoy since you work a lot with contact centers. When I was at E-Trade, we ran um, a company-wide innovation challenge. And the idea was to engage employees to get business plan proposals, not just because we wanted proposals, but because we really wanted to sort of reignite the innovation DNA in a company that, that really was a disruptor um, when it was founded. And everybody in the company was predicting that people in technology were going to win. The company is about a 30 employees or tech employees, so it's a very, very tech-driven company. And um, we ran a very rigorous process with outside judges. I and mean, it was a serious challenge. Um, the, the winning team was a group of, of call center representatives um, out of about 60 or 70 proposals that were submitted. And I, you know, probably high school graduates, maybe, you know, to your college. And they, their, their proposal and plan trumped those of, of people who others were assuming we're going to just get a slam dunk. So to me, that was, that was very, very heartwarming and exciting. Well, I'm sure that kind of brought it full circle for you talking about being in the, behind the pharmacy counter and all of that. <laughs> you, the people, you know, and I say, you know, it's funny. And the, the companies I worked in, people would sometimes refer to the people in the call center as back office. And I'm like, wait a second. We're in the back. We never, we're in a, we're in a direct consumer virtual business or, you know, remote business the people who are talking to the customers are the people who are on the phone or, or now the people who are on, you know, on chat. Um, they have incredible insight about how customers are feeling and engaging with products and services, what's working for them, what's not working for them. Um, that's, 
very important insight to get and and executives should do it as well not just not just mid-level people everybody should spend time with customers it's eye-opening it totally is and even what you're talking about in regards to those call logs uh, is that you know there's technology these days for all of that with speech analytics and you know being able to look at you know key phrasing word spotting I mean all, emotional detection I mean all of these things have become quite sophisticated over the past couple of years and it used to be that only the very largest of large organizations could utilize some of those tools because of the cost uh, and now over time you know scalability is is starting to take effect and a lot of organizations can take it you know, advantage of a lot of that discovery uh, that they weren't able to do before. However, it just goes back to that whole inertia thing is that, well, we've never really done that. Uh, you know, I've, I'm not exposed to that. And it goes back to that whole seeking thing. And, and the reason I bring that up is because you said, you said something that I think is critically important is you talked about the innovation DNA of an organization. So if I don't have uh, innovation DNA within my organization, how do, where do I need to start that? Big question. I think, first of all, you need, you know, I'll tell you how I got started on this stuff. Part of it was, I guess, my wiring, you know, going back to, to how I was raised in my education. But the way I got started working on, you know, innovation per se was um, I was in this uh, digital job at City, and really my responsibility was to figure out, like, what's the impact on digital of a business that at the time was generating $5 billion in earnings. We were about a quarter of Citigroup's earnings. This was a very important um, business that analysts cared about a lot. Um, my boss came to me one day, the CEO, and he said, Amy, um, I want you to make us more innovative because we're not innovative and we need to be innovative. And at the time, I was like, okay, either he thinks I'm really special or I've, I've drawn the short straw. You know, I'm the only person crazy enough to do this. And I'm, you know, you don't say no to the CEO. So it's like, okay, boss, I'll go figure it out. And honestly, I started um, networking and reading and saying like, what is this? And as luck would have it, there was a, a gentleman named Larry Keeley, who's a real authority on this whole topic of how do you create a discipline around innovation? And you know, I was very lucky being at a place like City who had those resources. Um, he really, he, he mentored me. But I think the thing is to go out and start asking, um, who in your network would know anything about this and where do you start? But I think for me, it's a couple of lessons. Um, the CEO has to care, right? And I mean, any change initiative in an organization, if there isn't active sponsorship from the top, uh, hard to get any place. Um, he or she uh, needs to create accountability across his or her entire direct report team. So it's not enough to say, oh, I've got this head of innovation, because you have sort of a target on your back, right? if the rest of, if your colleagues aren't um, putting some skin in the game. And then it's how do you, um, I've always found that the people, that there are always people in the organization who care about this. Now, anybody who sees a career runway in front of them um, and has ambition is gonna be scratching their head and saying like, doesn't management get it? Like, what are they doing? The world is changing. You know, we all carry a computer in our pockets. We all know about one-click shopping, you know, you go on and on and on. So all this innovation has pervaded and taken over our lives. So people know it's a matter of identifying them, um, empowering them, and protecting them. So, um, uh, and putting some structure around what it is you're asking them to do. So linking innovation to a real business goal, you know, having a real business objective, and, but people at, at E-Trade, I used to keep a list of people I called the hand raisers. And I was like, anybody who reached out to me, um, I was like, they, they care. And, and built an informal network. So I think ultimately you need some dedicated resource. But as soon as people in an organization know there's a senior executive who cares and the CEO is nodding their head up and down, um, people will start to just identify themselves. Well, I know what you were just talking about. I mean, you talk about tribe, community, uh, champions. I mean, you know, a lot of folks have actually formalized that particular process of, you know, doing all of that networking and connecting of all those hand raisers and all those pot stirs. I mean, because they can do what you said when they, coll when they collaborate and work together, um, they can actually raise the tide for everybody when, it, when you start talking about this innovation DNA. Right. It creates talent magnet. 
Now, everybody is, you know, we're in a low unemployment situation. And even, it, you know, and, and then even beyond that, there are so many specific skill sets that are in demand. And so being perceived as a brand that is on the move and interested in, you know, and active about continuing to adapt to where the world is going is going to automatically make it easier for you to attract better people. So, yeah, it's like the rising tide that lifts all ships. But so beyond the info, there are things, you know, the networking and the informal actions to just like watch for who's stepping forward. Um, you know, we've done some, I've done some things in the past, like um, when we first got going at, at City on our innovation efforts, we would organize brainstorming sessions where we were deliberately very collaborative. We would invite in people from product, people from tech, people from, um, you know, all parts of the organization, analytics, et cetera, and we'd brainstorm. Um, we'd look at different aspects of the customer experience or different segments of our customer base and say, okay, let's just think about how could the introduction of digital channels impact the customer relationship? And we would implement tests. So those kinds of sort of semi-structured um, collaborative sessions also started to draw people in and, you know, everybody likes to be on a winning team. They're excited about this stuff. Um, and, and, you know, we gradually influence the entire organization to the point where instead of digital just being sort of the domain of a department and innovation being the domain of just a small group of people, there were many, many people in the organization supporting our projects um, with their managers understanding that this stuff really mattered. Well, and what you're talking about here and all the words and descriptors and, you know, momentum and movement and inspiration and, in, I mean, all that is just loaded with emotion that we had talked about before and it's in your book. But one of the things that we like to do on the show uh, in order to help with that emotion charge is look at quotes that people like. So is there a quote or two that you could share that you like? Yeah, one of my, one of my favorite quotes from the book um, comes towards the end and it's that, um, yeah, I'll read this to you. You know, big companies have funding, scale, brand, infrastructure, but they also have bureaucracy and don't see near-term value of innovation. Startups are hungry. They bring speed, burning passion, and agility, but they may be furiously and passionately barking up the wrong tree. And so, you know, the point is, you know, startups don't have a monopoly on innovation and big companies don't have a monopoly on bureaucracy. And I think that, you know, that's a major sort of aha and conclusion um, and takeaway from the book is that, um, you know, we all talk about the importance of diversity, but really a great way to get moving is can you form interesting collaborative relationships that bring together people with different perspectives, skill and experience? You know, I get very irritated. I, I you know, working with startups, I'll say, oh, those big companies, they're dinosaurs they're going away. And then you meet with corporate people and they say, oh, so startups, they get away with murder. And I'm like, you know what? Listening is an underrated skill. If these, you know, folks in these different camps don't see themselves as in different camps, but listen and realize they have a lot to learn from each other, um, they will all advance their, um, their objectives. Uh, that's so totally true. I think we all have our own circumstances and situations and we have to learn how to, you know, iterate and pivot and, you know, adapt, you know, within our own environment. And that's one of the things that also we focus in on the show is times when people have gotten over the hump on something and what they've learned from that. Is there a story where you've gotten over the hump or that you can share? Yeah, I talked a little while ago about uh, this uh, issue of resourcefulness. You know, we never have enough resources and a lot. And, you know, one of, I think the big aha moment for me when I realized, wow, you really can break the orthodoxy of the corporate world that, you know, you can't do anything because you have a budget or a team. I met a, an early stage founder um, named Drew and he was um, advancing a medical device that is basically the moral equivalent of an inflatable airbag that would open in that split second when an elderly person began to fall. And, I, you know, the statistics on the, the number of deaths that occur every year because of elderly people falling and the cost to the, um, the healthcare sector are just, it's frightening, right? And so he, through a personal experience, became very passionate about this. So, you know, you can imagine for a medical device, the, um, the bar is unbelievably high. 
on getting approval. And so he had this sort of catch-22 situation where he couldn't get even his early stage funding until he could prove that there was some chance of this working. But he couldn't prove that there was a chance of this working without some resources. So what he did was um, went down to a, a car junkyard on a Saturday morning with his, with his son and combed through the cars and found uh, airbags that were reusable, you know, not destroyed, not, you know, bloody or anything. Took them to his tailor with some bicycle inner tubes and, you know, for a couple of bucks, sewed up a crude enough uh, prototype to, to raise his first few hundred thousand dollars in, in angel funding. And so that story, I'm like, wow, I will never again complain uh, or tolerate complaints from others about not having resources. It's kind of like, where's your junkyard? You know, what can you do? And so that, that was a big one for me because having spent over 20 years in the corporate world, I was used to a way of doing things. And then I took myself out on the street and said, I really want to change my career. I want to use my expertise to help other people. And I think I could do that in a bigger way outside the corporate world. But it's a little like, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're like naked. You know, like, where's all that structure? Where are all those resources? Where's that budget? Where's my CFO? I've got to figure things out. And uh, so that, that's a story I, I probably think of on a daily basis. And my Amy, thank you for sharing that. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, I mean, the Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust, your rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Amy Raiden, are you ready to hold down? I am ready. Okay, Amy. What is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Here. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Try it. There's, there's nothing wrong with trying. What is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? Having a network uh, that I give to and full of people who are willing to step up and help me. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Intellectual curiosity. I, I am a constant learner. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? And it could be from any genre. Of course, of course we're going to put a link to your book on the show notes page as well. I'm just finishing a great book. A great book um, by uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who's a futurist philosopher, called *Sapiens*, about the history of humankind and on this whole topic of change and how did how did humans get to be sort of the the dominant species, if you will. It's a fascinating and and quite accessible read on a complex amount of information. It's on my it's on my bedside right now and quite enjoying it. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net forward slash Amy Raiden. Okay, Amy, this is my last hump day. Hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take everything back. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I think that what I would take back is the how important it is to establish and invest in a diverse network of relationships. It's what I, I happen to have a 25-year-old child, and I push her on that topic every day. Because in a world of constant change and unknowns, even if you think you know everything today and you've mastered what you, you know, the skill or function that is going to drive you through your career, it's, it's going to be different tomorrow or even by, by tonight. And my key to staying relevant is, is constantly investing in relationships. So I tell myself, it's not, I don't need to, it's not what I know. It's that I know who to call. Amy, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Sure. Um, if you visit my website, which is www.amyradin, R-A-D-I-N, Com. You can find some free resources on the website, a download of content from the book, a one-page PDF infographic of the Seek Seed Scale framework, and also you might want to take the Changemakers quiz 
and sign up for my monthly e-newsletter. So I'd love it if you would do that. Amy Raiden, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 